So this webinar is recording and we will share it out for the Aquilani's community to see for those that weren't able to make the webinar this morning. Um, but again, it's our first Don's Dialogue webinar. We're so happy to have those of you that could join us and we'll do a quick introduction of our panelists um, this morning. So I'll turn it over to our APC co-presidents. Everybody, I'm Sarah Cusimano. Um, nice to see you virtually, sort of. Um, welcome to today, and um, I know it's going to be a lot of really great information. Um, as questions come up, I know um, Mr. Bell will explain this, but we, just so that you know, um, Don and I are always available to help you um, answer questions now or at any time. You can contact us via email um, at president at aklanisparentsclub.com, and we have a lot of really great things that we're working on with admin and leadership um, to get us through this time. Yeah, and the only thing I would add, I'm Dawn Brightville, and we're just super excited that we have 59 attendees. We had no idea how this thing, we didn't know if 66. it was- 66. Oh, good. We weren't sure we're about us, so we're really excited yeah. others are interested. Um, we're actively looking for ways we can support our parent community during this time. We put a lot of the content of what we're doing in the newsletter, so we hope you recognize that that really is our primary source of information for our parent community right now. So if you're not reading it, or you're not getting it, get in touch with us. And then as Sarah said, we are always open for um, new ideas and to take your feedback. So get in touch with us and we're always happy to um, try and act on your suggestions. So thanks and welcome. I'm gonna turn over to uh, our associate principals now for quick introductions. Sure, hi everyone, my name is Mike Plant. Uh, I'm here, uh, uh, Powers and I will be kind of behind the scenes trying to answer some of the live questions and, and, and kind of trying to help uh, the, the uh, seminar today flow smoothly. So happy to be here, hope everyone is well. And Ms. Powers, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry. Oh man, technology. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrea Powers, I'm Associate Principal. Um, and uh, like what uh, Mr. Plant said, we'll be answering some questions in the chat. It's nice to see you all here virtually and uh, hope you're all um, health and taking care. Uh, and then I'll turn it to Ms. Sassner. Um, hi everyone, and uh, Travis, a little piece of business. Can you add um, Alan Choi because as a panelist, because he is um, in the, uh, he is along with our attendees, yeah. and I'd love for all the parents to see his face as well. I'm the intake specialist. Um, really, really super happy to be here and looking forward to hearing from everyone. Um, and and Alan should be here in a minute as well. There he is, Alan. You want to unmute and uh, introduce yourself real quick. Thanks. Yeah, it was nice being promoted as a panelist. So <laughs> said that there, got promoted already. Um, uh, I'm Alan Choi. I'm the wellness coordinator. Um, work um, Casey and I together, sort of uh, help manage our wellness program and trying to do all the little things out there right now to see if we can provide any ounce of support to students. Great. Thank you. And then lastly, our student, our student rep here, uh, Maddie Wilson. Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Wilson. I'm the student body president at Aquilonis. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some stuff that leadership's been up to and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so a huge thank you to all of our panelists for, um, for uh, being willing to kind of share today, just some updates of what's going on during this campus closure of COVID-19. We, um, we do wanna share some updates from Aquilonis and I'll review the agenda in just a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen so that you guys can, um, uh, follow along while we're talking here. So hopefully you're able to see the screen that I'm sharing um, with you. But um, I, I, before we before we jump forward, just a few quick kind of Zoom webinar norms. So I do have, um, I thank you to everyone who submitted questions previously. I have those questions. I think a lot of them are gonna be answered over the course of this presentation. But then I have uh, typed out some of the questions um, towards the end. So I'll make sure that I address those specifically. And then if there's questions as I present, there's a, there's a, a I think it says Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And you would just, you would uh, submit questions through there. And then our panelists, um, both the co-presidents and then our two associate principals, they'll be trying to answer some of those questions as we go. Um, and then at the end, they'll float those questions to me that, that I need to address live. And then we can do any other open Q&A um, that come up at the end of this presentation. 
I did want to just reiterate again, I announced it at the start, but for those that are just joining in, we are recording this um, webinar and it will be posted um, uh, afterwards. Um, I'll share it out via our, our school communication and it will be posted to uh, my YouTube page so that people that have missed this Don's dialogue will be able to access it. I believe it will also be found on the APC um, webpage as well, so you can make sure that you access it there. Some of our panelists, um, Casey, Allen, and Maddie, um, are gonna jump off after their part. So just know that they're not sticking around and we don't have an expectation for them to stick around for the whole Don's dialogue, but we did want them to start with us because they're gonna kind of uh, kick, the, kick the, the agenda off here. As I said, we're gonna start with our wellness center information. So um, Casey and Allen will share a little bit of what our virtual wellness center looks like and what students can access and take advantage of as well as provide some resources um, uh, if needed for the, for the community. And then, um, then we'll get to hear from Maddie Wilson who will give us some leadership updates and just some student activities that are happening. Um, that should be about 10 or 15 minutes. And then afterwards, I'm gonna go through some distance learning updates, which will include the guidelines that we've been sharing out. I wanted to go a little more in depth with some of those guidelines. I did wanna talk about the uh, recent decision of the district to go to credit, no credit, and for the semester and what that means um, for our students. And then I'll share a little bit about um, College Career Center and counseling at Akawani's, and then we'll end with um, our open Q&A. But, since it is Friday, and this is gonna be the communication that I share out, we had to start with our quarant meme of the week, which I just feel like is so appropriate because uh, my days are spent on Zoom. And if, if this was some sort of uh, mastermind, this COVID-19, I think we could all start with people who work at Zoom and see if they had something to do with the COVID-19 and our school closure because Zoom has taken over so um, I should be investing some stock in it, actually. Um, but that's our current meme of the week. So hopefully that gave you a little smile on this Friday morning. Um, I want to turn it over to Casey and Alan, who can talk about um, our virtual wellness center. And um, I'm controlling the screen. So you'll, you're going to hear them say things like, Travis, can you advance the slide for us now? And just know that that'll be part of how the presentation works. So Casey, take it away. Great, thank you. Um, what we're gonna do, uh, everyone, is I'm gonna provide some updates and then Alan is gonna jump in where I miss anything. Um, we're a great team that way and then he's gonna take over on Q&A. I just wanna begin with a little bit of gratitude. Always a good way to get settled. Um, I wanna thank parents. Um, I wanna thank Alkalani's Parent Club. Like, so grateful um, for these guys at this time to be um, getting information out to parents and supporting us. Also want to thank parents um, who fund LPI. You know, thank you to LPI. Um, that's why Wellness is here, and we're really grateful to them. Um, I'm going to start very quickly going through my slides. Um, before I do, I want to share a quote that I would have put up here if I had encountered it sooner. And this is from Milton Friedman. Times of crisis can turn seemingly impossible ideas into not only possible, but necessary. And that's how we feel of, about what we've done with wellness um, over the last four weeks. Um, very quickly, here are some of the things that we're doing. Um, we are coordinating as a team, um, but especially coordinator and mental health um, support counselors with families and students. That includes counseling and connection to resources. Um, we are doing a letter writing campaign and we are hearing from students um, by email. Um, they're reaching out because they miss us. We're reaching out to them because we miss those who we know. Um, we are currently doing a survey of what, what students need. I apologize for that dinging. Um, we're providing online programming. I'll get into that. Um, in a minute, communicating via Instagram, social media, best way to reach kids, um, as well as other outlets. Um, we're doing a lot of training as a team, as much as we can. We, we are students in this as well, learning about the changes in telehealth and how to provide it, how to respond to trauma, because this is in the natural disaster category of, of a trauma, even though it's an ongoing one, which is unusual. Um, and then also learning a lot about how to connect and engage online. Um, next slide, Travis, thank you. 
Um, basically, th this is the point at which parents can, can tune in and go, these are all things that you can do with your students as well. This is how we are supporting students with the shelter in place and COVID-19 and anxiety and uncertainty around that. We're creating a lot of space to listen to them, to listen and to listen mindfully, which means to listen without formulating a response, without giving advice, just creating a container to hold um, where they're at. We're also normalizing their experience. Many of what um, adolescents are experiencing, we as parents are experiencing too. Um, we're connecting and creating connections um, with other students. Um, we're giving them a lot of encouragement. The big message to them is everything they need is within them. Um, they, they can still get help, but they, but they do have what they need. Um, and I will challenge anyone offline who says that this generation is not resilient. Um, we see it every day that they are. We're teaching. Um, I'll get into that in a second. We're also modeling that we're doing the things we're teaching. And Travis, if you can go to the next page, we'll look at programming. Um, so right now we have Tuesday through Friday online programming that's open to all students. Um, they can find information about that on um, Loopmail. On Tuesday, we're doing tea. It's spill the tea and have some tea with wellness staff. It's very open and organic. Um, it doesn't have specific programming, but so far it's been meeting a lot of kids where, where they are. Um, Wednesday, we have journaling through the pandemic, which is great for kids who want to write um, their experience. Thursday, quarantine cooking. It's just a lot of fun. Um, and we have one of our support counselors who's actually creating recipes. It's just like a cooking show. It's fantastic. Um, and then on Fridays, like today, I am doing um, a mindfulness um, event. We call them Friday Focus. In this crisis, I am focusing on mindful minutes, um, which are interventions throughout the day. Please follow us to learn more about these um, on Akalani's Wellness on Instagram. You can even get a lot of parenting tips on there and tips for, your, for yourself for regulating your own nervous system that you can share with students. And next, Travis, I'm trying to stick to this five minutes. Am I doing good? Great, I got the thumbs up from Travis, which is just what I live for. Um, so we have some words from students and I have a little bit of a double screen. I am not gonna read all these, but I do want you guys to see the kinds of things that students are saying to us about this virtual wellness and what wellness continues to mean to them, um, to, to embed in you guys the need to get your kids to, to check and see what's there, um, but also that we can get you to commit to always um, having wellness be, um, be a priority uh, for your families um, and for schools in the district. And I think I'll leave it at that, Travis, because I think that's five minutes, maybe even more. No, I think that's great. And I do just want to thank Casey and Alan have just done so much work having to pivot so quickly um, and figure out both the, um, the legality of what can illness continue to offer um, in terms of some of that targeted support when, when you're really looking at school-based counseling services and then how to provide some of those resources um, afterwards. And I know even, uh, I think AHS Don's posted on their account yesterday just a little video that um, Ms. Sassner had done about uh, breathing on screen time, which there is a lot of screen time during this. Uh, this global pandemic and um, and I found myself like putting those own practices into place and so really appreciate the work that they're doing. Um, I want to, uh, I'm not, my screen is shared so I'm not seeing but from our panelists Don and Sarah or Andrea and Mike, are there any questions that have come up uh, for Casey or Alan that we should look at trying to um, answer address now or we can we can thank them for their time and and then uh, move on. Yeah, there were, there were no questions pending in the Q&A right now. So I, I think it's, um, I think we can move on. Okay, great. Alan, uh, anything you'd like to share before we, um, before we uh, move to our student um, activities and updates? Uh, no, I mean, Casey had a wonderfully eloquent and uh, concise uh, summary of what we're doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, if there are any ideas, thoughts, um, feel free to share them with us. This is a grand experiment for us because we have had to pivot from having no, from having a physical wellness center to trying to make it virtual. So we have had to build a lot of stuff up and also as Travis said, with the legality. So um, we're really open trying to see what, what works. 
Um, we're trying to constantly survey students, so um, students and community members and parents. So um, yeah, feel free to share and definitely um, encourage your kids to just come check us out online. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Casey and Ellen, uh, really, you're welcome to stay on as panelists, or uh, or you can sign off whatever you'd like to do. Um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep moving and really appreciate your work, effort, and engagement in supporting our students and our our community during this time. So really appreciate that. Um, all right, uh, Miss Wilson, you're up as our ASB president here, and so I'll click over to your next side. But um, tell us tell us what we need to know about all things uh, staying involved and connected. All right, yes, I'm excited. So I'll keep this short, I'll keep it at five minutes, but I'm super excited to be able to talk with you all. Uh, I know our ASB officers love when we can get and reach out to the community and I'm excited to be able to speak with everyone. So Aucalanes has basically just been focusing on the idea that although school and other events have been canceled, our community cannot be canceled. And you'll see a ton of hashtags that say hashtag community can't be canceled because it's just this big idea that we've been following through throughout this whole quarantine process. Every week we've been releasing a video that contains staff, students, alumni, and community members sharing a positive message, ideas to stay busy, a dance, a poem, and more to help keep our school and community connected. There have been four episodes so released so far and they can all be found on the Akalani's Instagram, AHS underscore Dons. And I'll be releasing the fifth episode this Sunday, so keep an eye out for that. Our Paint the Town Blue initiative was also focused around this idea of community cannot be canceled. Signs were put out of every single senior's house, blue posters were hanging in store windows, blue decorations and posters were put up on the walking trails and outside of homes as a way to show our love for Akalani's and the Lafayette community. We worked with local restaurants and businesses to help promote the easy and safe ways that, um, they can, that the community can help support them during these difficult times. And a huge thank you to the Lafayette Chambers of Commerce, Parents Club, Admin, and Ms. Walton for helping put this together. I know personally, I've heard so many great things from students about this, especially from our seniors. They were so grateful and just felt really special to see those yard signs outside of their house. So a big thank you for that. I think it really, really brought everyone together. Also, our school-wide Instagram has been doing its best to keep everyone connected as well. Each day of the week, similar to wellness, has been a different theme, including Mindfulness Monday, Tip Tuesday, Wellness Wednesday, Thankful Thursday, sometimes Tasty Thursday if we want to mix it up a little bit, um, Fitness Friday, and Shout Out Saturday. Every single day we post different things corresponding to that day's theme. And I encourage you all to follow our Instagram account if you aren't already. Can't stress this enough. I'm very proud of our account. Follower ratio has been going up and up. Um, and there's some really cool things being done on there. So you can find us at AHS underscore Dons. Super great resource, and I encourage you all to look at it. ASB is also currently working together to put on a virtual talent show because it's a big event that a lot of students look forward and we were really bummed that we couldn't host it in person. So we are making it virtual and we're gonna do it. It's gonna be super cool. We've already started collecting videos of all the acts and hosts and we're gonna put together one big video and then stream it live on April 24th, one day after the actual talent show was supposed to be and people can tune in, chat and see it live. It's gonna be really, really cool. And I hope to see you all there. ASB and class officer elections also starting this week and voting closes today. All the candidates have been doing an amazing job campaigning from home by using social media. And I'm excited to see the turnout of that. There's been a lot of positive messages sprouting from that. Another cool thing is the Lafayette Social, our local magazine, is dedicating part of their June issue to the class of 2020. All seniors who live in Lafayette, whether or not they go to Akalani's, are encouraged to submit anything from a piece of writing to a quote, to a video, to a piece of art, to help express the class of 2020 silver linings. Seniors do not need to be a distinguished writer or a super impressive artist. Lafayette Social just wants to hear from them. And this is a super cool opportunity for them to be featured in a distinguished print magazine. And I was looking through the participants. I know I saw some senior parents out there. So if you are listening, please encourage your seniors to submit something. It's really, really cool. And we are grateful for Lafayette Social to help us, um, helping us putting that on. And you can find more info on that along with the submission form on our Instagram and on School Loop. And then lastly, we have dedicated the month of May to our seniors. We are running a senior speaker series um, just for seniors with some top professionals and alumni. I've heard a few of the names that are going to be talking, and they are all amazing people, some of which have already spoken at Akalani's, and I know seniors are excited to hear them speak. 
We are also moving forward with time of reflection, although it will be virtual, a senior signing ceremony for anyone moving forth in athletics and performing arts in college. We're gonna have senior sunset virtually, our annual senior video and senior hangouts over Zoom. And seniors are gonna receive a postcard in the mail with all of these events. So if I'm talking really rapidly to fit this in the five minutes, don't worry, they'll be sent a postcard. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that I know as a senior, times have definitely been very tough right now, but it certainly has made me realize how lucky I am to be part of this community. And everyone here knows I love being a Don. I live and die by Akalani's, but I have felt so proud to be a Don lately. And I'm really, really thankful to all, I'm not just saying this because I'm on the Zoom. Um, I'm really, really thankful for all admin has done. I just feel Although a lot of stuff has been taken away from us, there's been so many silver linings coming out of this. So thank you everyone for making that happen. Thanks, Maddie, really appreciate that. I wish this was like Instagram Live because you would have just seen like the fire of hearts coming, <laughs> up, the, coming up the screen. Thank you, thank you. Um, Maddie, a question for you. I've gotten a couple of responses from parents asking if they don't have Instagram or if their kids don't have Instagram, what's the best way for them to get that information um, are we posting it on the leadership part of our web page I know APC has some what do you what would you say to that yeah absolutely so we recognize not everyone has Instagram and I think the main way we've really been trying to get everything out is through school loop email but also on the leadership page of the Akalani's website I think almost everything that we post on AHS Dons is being sent out through school loop you might not get to participate in fitness Friday but we are trying very hard to uh, get everything out and on Fitness Friday, definitely check that out. Aiden Mosley has been doing a pretty impressive job with that. So, <laughs> fun. Yeah. I probably should be more embarrassed to admit this, but I've I've done some of the Fitness Friday ones and like can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, he's impressive. Uh, so they're they're good yeah. workouts. So I appreciate that. Um, I'll just really quickly look at our panelists. Is there any questions coming in in the Q and A for Maddie to answer before we let her uh, get back to her distance learning on this Friday? Ms. Yeah, Howard. Maddie, can you quickly confirm um, about seniors decorating doors on Sunday? I know that that is something that the senior parent liaisons um, and leadership have been talking about, but is there any more direction on that? Yeah, so I think an email should be coming out with more direction yeah. on that really, really soon. And I think it's Sunday, but I know that senior parents are just going to be decorating doors kind of with general dawns, publicity, or future plans just as a way to celebrate our seniors. I told my mom I am not having anything to do with it and our door better look cool. Um, but that's the that, that's what I know on that. But there'll be an email coming out soon. Great. Thank you. Yeah, awesome, Maddie. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else from the panelists in terms of questions for Maddie? I think we're all good. Mr. Plant, you, oh wait. No, sorry, yeah, the, uh, the only other thing was a commendation about how great Maddie is, which I'd like to also uh, <laughs> emphasize, uh, you know, uh, Maddie, you are awesome. Yeah, I would agree with that. Ms. Cusimano. Also, there's a question about yearbook distribution. Do we have any estimate on when those will be distributed and how? Yeah, I can answer that more, Maddie. I'm not sure. Um, you probably don't know much about that, right? I, I just know it's going to look really cool for my friends in yearbook, but I don't know when it's coming out. Um, yeah, we, uh, the yearbooks are still scheduled to be delivered on time to Akalani's, and we're um, uh, trying to figure out what that will look like for the distribution of yearbooks, and we'll just keep people posted. So um, because it won't be till um, mid-May anyways, we're kind of hoping there's going to be some updates in terms of what the shelter in place looks like. And if you saw Newsom's press conference, I think that was Tuesday of this week, um, he did say he hopes to have more answers of timelines on May 1 that he can share out, uh, depending on if we continue to see that curve. Um, he used the words, um, it can't say stagnant. We have to see a decrease in, in the curve, um, but we should know more on May 1. And then that will dictate for us what the yearbook distribution looks like, um, which is similar to what we're experiencing with, you know, uh, trying to get textbooks out or returning textbooks, returning devices, that sort of stuff, which we'll just know more once we kind of get some guidelines from the health department. So um, great question. All right, uh, Maddie, thanks so much for your time. We don't want to keep you on. So feel free to leave. We won't be offended, although you're welcome to stay. And then um, before I jump into distance learning, Casey or Alan, uh, again, you're welcome to stay on as as panelists, but I can also uh, 
convert you to attendees if you'd rather not have your face on the screen. So you, you can convert me. I'm going to stay on as a parent. So. All right. I'm going to change your role to attendee. Um, and I'm and I, leaving to get back to work. All right. You're going to leave. Great. Um, thank you uh, to those to those panelists who join. Uh, uh, Mr. Troy, thank you so much. All right. We're going to continue uh, moving forward here with some of our um, distance learning guidelines. Uh, and I wanted to start by just sharing some of the guidelines that I would say are for teachers, students, and parents. Um, I've actually shared a lot of these guidelines in our uh, Don's Connection videos on Fridays, but having some more time. Um, well, first off, I did notice that my videos had about a four to five minute retention rate, and I might not have gotten into these until like minute 15. So I've learned <laughs> um, in terms of like what my videos need to look like um, and how to best get some communication out to our, um, out to our community. Um, so, but also this provides a venue where I can go a little bit more in depth and uh, for it to, to receive some questions that might come up from some of these guidelines. So um, I wanted to start by saying, as far as the, the weekly structure goes, we've really outlined what we think like three simple steps to kind of maintain an effective weekly structure. And this is true for our teachers to our students. Um, the first is that everything should be posted to School Loop. What we have told our teachers um, continuously is that everything needs to be posted to School Loop. So even if they're using a platform, like I know many teachers are using Google Classroom, um, that assignment that's posted in Google Classroom still needs to be an assignment in School Loop. And um, when they click on the School Loop assignment, it should just link them. There should be a link in there to bring them into the Google assignment. Um, we know it, they're called LMS and it's a learning management system. And we know that School Loop, um, uh, every learning, learning management system has its faults and some things that are great. Um, what we have right now is School Loop, and so that's what we're using, which is why we're directing everyone there. So I, I know and I hear how frustrating it can be to have these multiple platforms that um, students have to go to to get assignments and to submit assignments. What we're trying to do is to not limit those number of platforms, but to make sure it's really clear where every assignment is posted so that students and parents alike can go to one location to find out all of the assignments that um, have been posted or, or are expected of our, um, of our students. With that, um, we have also been encouraging teachers that um, as best as they can to try to post by Monday a schedule for the week. Um, what we're hearing, and I'm going to just, um, I, I want to do, I'm going to pause on that thought right here because I'm sure there's some questions um, and some responses of experiences that have come up about last minute Zoom meetings and that sort of stuff. One thing I did want to share with you is we, um, I, I got some feedback even just this morning when I was meeting with all of the department chairs from every department that School Loop has this default system for students. So when they're looking at their School Loop calendar, there's this little drop down box that says, show me. And I was trying to get a screenshot of what, it, I have to like hover over it. So as soon as I went to go to take the screenshot, it was, it was going away. Um, but when you click that drop down box, you need, there needs to be um, a check next to where it says work assigned date, because what's happening is it defaults to only showing um, the assignments that are due for that day. So when a student goes to look in at the assignment, they're not seeing what's due on Thursday, um, you know, on Wednesday and Thursday, because they're only seeing the assignment that is due for that Friday. But by checking that box, it should open up the calendar so that every assignment that has been posted, you'll be able to see for the week, which, which should be really helpful. I'm not sure why School Loop, it used to, anytime an assignment was posted, it used to just show the whole, like any assignment that was out there. I think what was happening, um, that's the feedback that School Loop was getting was students were getting overwhelmed with the amount of assignments that they were seeing. And this was a response to try to mitigate some of that some of that stress and pressure that was coming up. So they, they made it a feature that you had to opt in to see every assignment that was posted. So to the parents that are watching, I would encourage you and your, your student to make sure that that little box that says work assigned, so any assigned work um, will, will show on that calendar for the student. So I think that that could be really helpful. Um, with that, as far as trying to post a schedule by Monday, um, 
what we're saying is that it's best practice. Some of the feedback that I've gotten from um, teachers has been they they uh, an assignment comes in on a Tuesday and um, they they recognize like oh a lot of students are missing this concept. I'm going to host a, a a Zoom meeting tomorrow where I'm going to cover the topics of this of this concept. Um, and then so the, and then they're sharing that out. And then I'm also hearing the feedback from the students and the parents that I just got a notice at eight o'clock on Tuesday night that there's a Zoom meeting at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, um, but I didn't find out until it was like 11 o'clock Wednesday morning because of how that was posted. Um, so it's a little bit of a give and take and a balancing act of trying to make sure that those, um, that teachers are doing the best they can to, um, to post that schedule uh, for the week on Monday. There's a little bit more to that that will be covered in some of our like classroom norms. So um, I think it might answer some of those questions as we go. Families should expect, students should expect two to three hours of work per class per week. Um, we continue to say to our teachers um, that this is gonna look different for every student and it should because every student is different. So as best as they can to try to audit their assumptions of how long they think those assignments are gonna take. So we're really asking teachers to be checking in with students on, hey, how long did this assignment take? And if they're finding that assignments are taking longer, they need to cut back some of those expectations. Or if it's one or two students that are taking um, significantly long on assignments, to work with those students to say, hey, uh, I don't want you to spend more than 40 minutes on this one assignment. Um, and then let's check in on how I can help support you along the way. Um, and that would be, again, I would say both for the, um, the posting of the calendar as best they can and the amount of hours that it's taking, I would really encourage if you're, if you're feeling frustration, if you're, if you're experiencing some frustrations around um, your uh, students experience with that, that the first step would always be just a quick email to the teacher that can be done in a really tactful way that just says, um, hey, what we're finding it's taking a really long time to complete these assignments. I just wanted to let you know for some feedback, what can we do on our end to help streamline or something along those lines. The third sort of like weekly structure step would be that there are gonna be instructional opportunities throughout the week. And we refer to these as both synchronous and non-synchronous or asynchronous classes. Synchronous would be live classes where a teacher is hosting a Zoom webinar similar to this or a Zoom class or a Google, a Google Hangout, and they are going to be um, screen sharing or talking in person and reviewing live some sort of instructional comment for, um, uh, sorry, in instructional component for the students. Um, the, the asynchronous or non-synchronous lessons would be something that's pre-recorded that a teacher is sending out for students to watch as the lesson. Um, so there should be both of those instructional opportunities happening. A lot of teachers have expressed to me that what they're finding is um, they're, getting, um, they're not getting super high attendance to their synchronous class, so they might get even half their class to attend. Um, and then they're recording and sharing out those synchronous lessons but that they're um, doing a lot more pre-recorded lessons and then um, choosing to host synchronous office hours to engage with students in that component. So even though you might not be seeing from one teacher a lot of live lessons, there should be instruction that's coming out with opportunities to engage live um, with that teacher. And throughout the week, with the synchronous and asynchronous lessons, there's going to be feedback and intervention that's happening. We're going to get into talking about the credit, no credit component, but that doesn't mean um, just because it's credit or no credit that students shouldn't be, shouldn't be getting scores back on how they're doing or feedback on an essay that they wrote. We want students to still get that feedback so that they can, um, one, be responsible for their, for their own um, process of learning and to know where they're at and how they're doing so that they continue to, you know, um, uh, 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 advance through that curriculum. Um, but with the feedback, when a student's not understanding something, there should be opportunities for intervention along the way. So just this morning, hearing from a teacher who has just scheduled weekly, um, uh, like puts out a, a schedule at the start of the week where students can sign up for office hours with that teacher throughout the course of the entire week. So if a student needs support, they can meet with that teacher. 
but then that teacher is also reaching out to students and saying, hey, I want you to find a time to meet with me so that we can cover this, so that we can cover this material more um, in depth, because I, I noticed you're, you're, you, you have some gaps here in your learning. So that's sort of what the instructional opportunities should look like for the week. And these three components really would craft what a, what a weekly structure would look like um, for you or your student um, at home. As far as some class norms for, um, for this uh, distance learning, we have asked teachers to adhere to the pre-closure schedule. Um, this is mainly to mitigate classes overlapping and offering multiple Zoom lessons at the same time. So, um, what we're, uh, what we're, you know, seeing is that really the first and second period or fourth period classes on a block schedule day, that that attendance is pretty low from our low from our students. You know, first period starting at eight o'clock when they're offering a synchronous class at eight o'clock. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's there's not there's not a lot of uh, attendance on those early morning um, classes. However, we don't want to ask teachers to then just move that class to later in the afternoon because it's going to overlap with other classes that are offered during that during that scheduled time. Just like a quick sort of funny anecdote is um, I was talking to a, another teacher who said she had a, um, she was holding a meeting and asked uh, for a noon meeting with some students and, uh, and, and multiple of the students replied that they had to set an alarm for that for that noon meeting, which I think, um, uh, you know, it just speaks to our teenagers and, and where they're at in their sort of sleep cycle and learning and, and growing uh, process. But, um, but we do need to hold to some form of schedule in order to not have this, this overlap. So it should be happening, those synchronous classes should be happening during, the, um, during their regular scheduled class, period. However, um, teachers know and we know and we continue to emphasize this idea of flexibility um, and to consider outside school hours as they're available. Um, so we know some teachers are holding lessons at four o'clock or five o'clock um, just to try to create some space for students who might not be able to um, attend earlier schedules or lessons. And um, the other thing that we've said is that, um, I'm gonna just jump down to this, this second point here, is that if they're offering a synchronous class um, for a period, but they can't offer it for all the periods. We know a lot of our teachers are also home trying to manage their kids distance learning at home or that there's lots of uh, things going out there. I'm hearing from parents and, and families as well of multiple si siblings with, you know, only, you know, two devices in the house and they're having to navigate who's on what device and when for those lessons. Um, so the same is true with our teachers, that they should be rotating when they're offering that live synchronous class. Most teachers, from what I'm hearing, are trying to offer synchronous classes. Um, if they're doing a synchronous class, they're doing it for all of their class periods. Um, but if, that's, if, if they're not able to do that, that they should be able to, they should rotate so that kids can have the opportunity to be working with those teachers. Um, also, we are requiring that any synchronous lesson or class needs to be recorded um, because we can't uh, uh, mandate all students to attend a synchronous class because it's a global pandemic and there's lots that are, are going on. Um, we don't want any student to miss the opportunity to hear what was discussed during that, during that synchronous class. Much like with this Don's Dialogue webinar, um, where we're recording it so that we can share it out for anyone who missed. We have asked that our teachers should record every synchronous class that they, that they offer um, and then make that available for students to access. We're working with teachers on the students who have um, like a, uh, a no media release sign um, at the start of the year. Um, and those students should both mute and turn off their, um, their camera. Uh, parents can talk to their students if they're more comfortable with that happening as well. However, what I'm seeing are that most synchronous classes are similar to this webinar, where it's mostly the teacher's face and then the slides or the slide deck that the teacher is going through. So um, students typically aren't being put out there on those recorded synchronous classes. Um, and usually the stuff that comes um, after those synchronous classes 
uh, in terms of like the discussion and dialogue um, is similar where it's just a voice talking or a teacher responding to the questions that have been submitted in the chat that aren't necessarily included in, in the recorded synchronous in the recorded synchronous class. And then um, another classroom norm is that we are um, uh, talking about intervention with our teachers and with our students. So um, although we don't have these designated academy periods for that intervention, teachers are considering how to offer, offer an intervention. And as I said earlier, most of that is looking like office hours um, for drop-in meetings throughout the week. Um, and we've asked teachers again, we're trying to like create some sort of schedule so that there's not this overlap in classes and teacher meetings. So we're really asking that those office hours try to be scheduled during our regular academy hours, which would be Wednesday and Friday from around 10 to 11 for those drop in office hours. Or to offer those office hours during their regularly scheduled class period so that students can drop in when they're regularly scheduled with that class. So um, some again, some teachers um, on their schedule and availability or working with students and what the students are saying for their schedule or availability are going outside of school hours, like evening office hours and that sort of stuff. Um, but for the most part, this is what we've asked our teachers and our students to, um, to be engaging with. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about um, what assignments and assessments look like during distance learning. I know I've shared this during one of our, our Dawn's Connection as well, but assignments, um, we have to let some of the standards go during distance learning, both as a directive from the state that there can be no punitive consequences uh, in terms of um, grades for our students moving to an online platform and just knowing what we're able to do and get through when we've asked um, and, and have determined that it's really best to say two to three hours per class per week. That includes any of the synchronous um, classes, watching any of the webinars, any of the homework that's happening. Um, it's not about um, dumbing down the, the curriculum, um, which is not a phrase that I'm even really a fan of, but it's really paring down the curriculum to focus on the essential standards in the midst of a global pandemic that our students need to know. And we define our essential standards by really looking at longevity and leverage. So what is something that is critical beyond a single unit or course level for these students to know? And what is critical for multiple disciplines that can carry them through in a vertically aligned um, class structure, thinking specifically of like a world language class, advancing to Spanish three, if you don't have the fundamentals that you need in Spanish two, you're not gonna be able to be successful in Spanish three. So um, what are those essential components that a Spanish two student would need to learn? Um, that means we might have to pull out some of that, um, those cultural projects that are engaging students on the, you know, the, the um, Spanish culture, but rather looking at the language component of what they need to be successful um, in future years. These essential standards are being determined by um, our, uh, our departments and collaborative teams. So every Spanish two teacher, to continue to use the Spanish example, working as a collaborative team on identifying what those essential standards are and then teaching to those essential standards. The other component would be our assessments um, need to be formative and not summative. So um, a formative assessment is something that does just that. It informs the teacher on where a student is at. Um, what they have learned, what they have mastered, what they might need more um, support with, and it really informs the ongoing teaching and learning process, whereas a summative assessment is really more for demonstrating what has learned and is now kind of the final of we've done all the teaching and it's summative, we're hitting the end mark because when we move on, we're not continuing with that, with that learning. Um, it's really intended to show mastery and, um, and what we have been um, communicating during this time of distance and online learning is that while we are always striving for mastery with our students, um, it's more about learning those essential standards for the longevity and leverage of our students to be successful, um, and, then, and then continuing that teaching and lear learning for the remainder of this year. So all of our assessments during this, corner, during this quarter are um, going to be formative assessments. Um, that does mean that we will not have final exams this semester. 
there will be no final schedule, nor will the, there be summative final exams for our students um, to have to take. Okay, that was a lot in terms of the guidelines, and I know I am talking a lot. I'm seeing like the little like pop-up bar of things coming in. We will get to those questions, but I do want to continue in case some of the questions get answered over the course of addressing some of this. So, um, as I'm sure uh, it, uh, many of you are aware, and if you're not aware, um, I do want you to know that um, our district has moved to all semester grades being credit or no credit. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, a lot of, uh, a lot of anxiety around what this means for our students. Perhaps there's some uh, relief that comes from that as well. Um, I wanted to point out three sort of simple things that this means for your student as well as address sort of a really simple guideline of what credit looks like for a student. Um, coming out today should be a more um, in-depth Q&A or FAQ for our parent community that will be shared through the district website. Um, and then um, I will continue to share out from Akalani's um, on some more in-depth look at what credit, no credit means for our students and how, um, what that looks like speci in, specifically in each class. Three sort of like quick reflections on what credit or no credit means for your student. First is, um, that no letter grade will be reflected for spring semester for any student on our transcripts. It's going to say, or I think it's going to say credit or no credit. It might say um, uh, credit or uh, no mark or something like that. But it's, it's um, no mark's not the right word, but it'll, it's something along the lines of like credit, no credit. That's going to be what's reflected on um, the transcript for our students. Um, it should also be what's reflected in school loop so we know not all teachers have um, updated their their school loop gradebook to reflect but we are working on that audit and over the course of the next week those should all be adjusted to reflect no percentage points but only reflect a credit or no credit students will need credit for required classes to graduate um, i say required classes because if they don't get credit for a non-grad required class what that means is they don't get that credit going towards their their um, necessary credit to graduate but if they already have uh, credit all the credits that they need to graduate so I'm thinking of like our seniors who might have over the amount the the required 240 credits to graduate um, but even if they're already over that amount they still have to pass their English class their gov econ class um, and then depending on wherever they're at in the process of math or science and that sort of component so um, they do have to get credit for any required class to graduate. And um, the last thing that I wanted to say about what this means for your student is that our school, our district going to credit, no credit will be reflected on our school profile. And the next slide really shows for you kind of what our colleges and universities, both in California and across our nation, are really starting to put some language out, reflecting on what this means as many schools have gone uh, many districts have gone to credit, no credit. I'll also just pause really quickly and just say we know that our um, we're seeing a, a myriad of responses across the board in terms of how districts are handling moving to distance or online learning. So uh, yes, we know that you know one of the largest school districts in our state um, is handing out letter grades. That would be LA Unified. I think they also reported some um, significantly large number of students that they have yet to hear from. Um, um, engaging with the online learning. Um, so they're having to navigate what that looks like. I just was hearing a rumor that San Francisco Unified is considering just giving everyone A's for the semester. So districts are responding different ways. However, we have seen a lot of districts that have chosen to go to a credit, no credit um, semester grading response. This is a screenshot from, and anyone can access this, but the UC um, system is uh, uh, always schedules a series of webinars throughout the year. They've obviously adjusted their webinars to reflect um, questions coming in about school closure. And this was a UC, UC um, COVID-19 response FAQ webinar that they, they just did yesterday morning. And of the slides that they were reviewing in their webinar, this was just a screenshot that I grabbed from their slides. And you can go and watch for yourself to, if, if you're curious. Um, 
because they talk about a lot of other things. But this was just a slide that I, gra I grabbed that just talks about um, that they, uh, they will be reviewing um, students within the context of the opportunities, and that includes grading opportunities that were available to them. This has really always been the case, but I think it's important to highlight. So there are high schools um, in California that don't offer AP classes. When, when a, a UC or state university is reviewing um, that student's transcript, they have to look at the school profile to know that there are no AP classes offered and then they compare that student um, uh, accurately um, in terms of um, admittance into admittance into their um, college or, or university. So um, they just highlighted this here. I thought it'd be helpful for you to hear as well. And hopefully that um, maybe helps decrease some of the anxiety and what that means. But I am sure we'll continue to see more communication from more colleges and universities um, coming out about that. A really simple, simple guideline on what credit or no credit means um, is Credit is coming from students based off of engagement and effort with feedback provided. Um, again, we talked about how that's calibrated with departments and course alike teams, really with a, a focus on keeping it simple and being paring down to those essential standards. So focusing on the essentials, the leverage and the, the longevity that those students need um, for, for that specific class and that curricular content. Um, and to provide that feedback and update in terms of um, what that's gonna look like for the students. So providing that formative feedback on their progress and then assigning credit for the effort and engagement. In the FAQ that's coming out from the district, you should be seeing more specifics. Um, we have had lots of conversations at um, a district level with the superintendent, our two associate superintendents, um, the four principals from the comprehensive high schools and the, the principal from um, our Center for Independent Study on really trying to quantify what what engagement and effort looks like um, and we're trying to uh, narrow in on what that looks like. I would imagine by end of day today or early next week we'll have some quantified language around that and um, some rubrics around what effort and engagement mean that um, teachers and parents and students will be made aware of um, and really asking teachers to share with our students hey, here's what I expect to show effort and engagement on, on this assignment, um, and then working with students on that. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of questions that probably come up from that, and would just, um, I'll, I'll address what I can, but just know that there is more information coming in terms of um, that specific um, guideline on credit, no credit, since that decision uh, was made just on Wednesday at our board for the semester grade of credit, no credit. I'm gonna keep moving. I'm flying through a lot of this and then we'll, we'll have some time to answer. I, I'll also just pause here and say, I think we've adjusted our time to around 11.15, um, but uh, Don and Sarah as the uh, kind of facilitators through this will we'll hopefully, they'll, they'll keep us on track and, and they'll keep me on track. They're always telling me I talk too much, so I'm, I'm gonna keep working on that. But as far as um, effort and engagement go, here's how we've defined effort and engagement. Um, this is just sort of like a loose definition, again, more specifics and hopefully some quantifiable stuff will come out of the FAQ, but really um, engagement is, is really looking at the interaction with the teacher in the curriculum. So this could include a variety of things like turning in work, attending office hours, watching screencasts, uh, joining synchronous lessons, but there is some flexibility knowing that not all students are gonna be, be able to do all things for that for that engagement. And then effort is really um, defined as looking at um, showing the attempts to learn the essential standards, um, which could be like making corrections after a, a formative assessment was given um, and, per, you know, that they're doing some, some test corrections on that assessment. Um, and then again, participating in some of those class discussions. Um, it doesn't need to be mastery. We know all students are at different levels of skill and ability and prior knowledge. Um, and our job as educators is to try to help, help them access that and continue to give them feedback towards mastery. Um, but the mastery isn't required in order to get credit um, in a class. I did want to share some quick college and career updates. I'm sure most of the questions are coming in about some of those distance learning guidelines, but just some quick college and career updates, just so you know, um, that 
uh, our college and career has been um, highly engaged in providing um, resources to our parent community and to our student community. I know, I think she had a junior meeting today during this, this 10 o'clock um, hour that she's, she's working with students, uh, with junior students. I just shortened that students um, on um, talking about the college application process and, and um, that, what that's looking like for them and continues to uh, field questions from people that might have questions questions about the credit, no credit, and what that means for, for college applications. Um, she's holding, um, you can read all the stuff on the slide here, um, and, uh, but it is, there's just lots of opportunities to engage from the college and career level. She's emailing those out through School Loop. That is her primary mode of communication to students and parents is through School Loop. So continue to make sure that you're checking the School Loop emails um, for updates from our college and career advisor. Um, and um, I should know as well, she oversees our senior awards and um, I've been working closely with her on continuing to move forward with our senior awards and what that might look like this year in a virtual um, online environment for our senior awards. Okay, I wanted to highlight a few of the previously submitted questions. I think um, some of this stuff uh, has been answered as I've talked, but I'll um, make, try to bring some clarity to it as I share here, if there's not, and then we'll turn it over to the live open Q&A um, as I'm sure stuff has been coming in. In terms of uh, the school district's recommendation to teachers about um, listing assignments and due dates, um, we, we haven't given any specifics like adhering to the due dates of the scheduled class just because of how, how much flexibility we're trying to leave for our students and our teachers during um, during this distance learning. So um, what, we're, what we have asked of teachers is regardless of when the assignment is due, they need to adhere to that two to three hours per week of expected work and trying to post that, um, th those assignments and schedules on Monday so that students working with their, their parents can really structure and um, engage um, their time um, over the course of the week as appropriate. So. While I know that it could be frustrating to feel like every assignment is due Friday, um, for some of our, our students, what we're hearing is kind of getting all of the assignments on a Monday and then being able to work through the course of the week to have those assignments due Friday is actually really helpful. So we haven't given any specific guidelines in terms of assignments being due and needing to be turned in on a specific date or time. Um, however, we have talked to teachers and worked with them on they can't expect an assignment that's posted on um, a Tuesday evening to turn around and then be due Wednesday morning. Um, that they they need to still adhere. They need to still adhere to providing a whole um, day's class period time of of getting that assignment, being able to ask questions if they have it on feedback or clarity of that assignment before they have to turn that assignment in. I talked a little bit about um, following a normal block schedule. Um, the question that came in was specifically on the due dates co coinciding with normal class dates, which I think I just, just addressed, but if there's more, if it's not clear, I, would, I welcome that feedback and we can talk a little bit more about that. There was another question that came in about different workload levels and how is this being addressed? Um, and I would say that uh, it, you, you know, especially I know uh, if, if you have twins who are, um, you know, have two different teachers that there's, there's probably always been this experience of, of a different experience in each class. Teachers are doing what they can to try to align as much as possible with their course alike team. Um, so if I jump back to that Spanish two example, that Spanish two teachers are working together to try to align what those assignments are um, and what those essential standards are. Um, we have not asked for um, a common, perfectly aligned assignments or formative assessments, um, but, but that they have the autonomy based off of what they recognize as the need for their class um, to access those essential standards, um, to, um, to be aligned so that those, those essential standards are aligned for that. Um, if you have specific concerns again and are feeling like um, your, your student isn't getting um, lessons or assignments that are helping them move towards accessing those essential standards, I, I do think, um, and again, uh, in a tactful way, a, an email to a teacher just asking questions on, um, from a parent perspective, what you should be expecting to see from them so that you can help your student um, access those, those essential standards. 
Um, we know it's different teachers have different skill levels with technology, um, have different, um, uh, you know, uh, giftings and abilities when it comes to um, their engagement um, online with students and, um, and are doing different things um, to the best of their ability to engage. You could also email myself or Mr. Plant or Ms. Powers um, if you have specific questions on things that would be, you know, helpful for, um, uh, you know, for, for us to provide some feedback or to work with you on and, and engage with you on that if, if that's been your experience. Um, are there teaching standards or protocols for distance learning that are, um, that are consistent um, uh, among all teachers? Those norms that I just shared with you are the norms and the guidelines that we have reviewed with teachers as well. Um, so that is what you should be expecting from your students' teachers. Um, and, and again, I would say if, if, you, if that's not has not been your experience, um, if you're comfortable emailing the teacher to do so, or you can always reach out to um, myself, uh, Powers, or Plant, and, um, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. And then uh, we got a question about field use. I actually um, addressed this in my last Don's Connection video um, last week on Friday. Um, but the question is more about why is it being allowed? So I, I did want to point out that we have provided um, this sign around all of our uh, AUHSD facilities. Um, obviously, all you know, kid parks across the county are closed. I know it's been a big issue for my three kids just trying to do anything I can to let them get their energy out and run around. Um, but yeah, we've had lots of questions around our track use. And one of the things that we've said is, um, you know, in, in a global pandemic like this, having the ability to be able to go and walk the track um, provides a safe place for our families to walk. For some of our families that live um, on those crazy roads and they can't, they can't necessarily just walk out of their house and don't have a sidewalk necessarily to walk down, in some cases, the trails here in Lafayette, I know it's similar to the Iron Horse Trail where it can just feel um, like it's so much more narrow that it's like almost safer to go walk the track than to walk those trails in terms of keeping that social distancing in that six feet. We feel that um, being able to provide that space um, is a service that we can offer to the community this time that we value. Um, however, we continue to um, get some concerns and feedback both from people and uh, Lafayette PD on the field use and um, have adjusted to, to really say like if this can if we continue to see um, uh, you know the, the question really was specifically that they had saw what looked to be like a football game that was by high school students playing on the field um, we have locked we've we've strategically locked locked up all of our goals and and um, sort of like amenities on the field so that they can't be used that it really should just be like a space for people if they need to walk the track or um try to get a workout in to try to you know try to do that but um but we are we will close down the field if we feel like that's the directive from Lafayette PD and County Health that we're just not able to adhere to that so we are appealing to you parents first to really work with your student if they're going to go down to the track or to the field um and they um uh, they just want to take a soccer ball and um, do their own practice on the field or get a workout in, you know, running the stairs or the track. I, I think it's, um, you know, it's like, it's something at least we can provide the community. We also have concerns about the, the gates being jumped if they're locked and what that really, you know, means or looks like, but we are monitoring it. It's not okay for groups of people to be engaging or playing together, but it is a space that we, we, we would love to keep open if we're able um, to keep it to keep it open. Okay, um, that takes me through the formal uh, sort of distance learning guidelines and presentations that um, that I have and your previously submitted questions. I am going to stop sharing my screen, which gives the ability for you to see the other panelists, and um, and then I will turn it over to um, our parent club presidents, who have I think been facilitating questions that have been coming in. So, yeah, Sarah. Sorry, I was on mute. I think we're going to toss it to, we've been on the side communicating. I think Mr. Plant is going to help toss oh, yeah. the questions. For sure. We've all been trying to answer the questions in the Q&A, Travis, but then there are a couple that we thought we'd throw to you. Um, Absolutely. So the, the first was just about um, whether AP and honors classes also have to fit within the two to three hour um, window. So uh, that's a quick one, maybe. 
Yeah, um, we are asking for all classes to be in that two to three hour mark. College board, um, so honors classes would be included in that. The, the, uh, the AP sort of like caveat to that is college board really has, they kind of dictate their own curriculum. So it's working with our teachers to try to align as best as they can to that two to three, but we know that really what College Board has put out is a bunch of resources on their own website for students to be accessing and, um, and using to prep for those AP exams. But even College Board has shifted. I mean, that exam, I think what they said, uh, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, is the online exam, people can expect a 45 minute online exam, which is different in the past. So even they have pared down that sort of like expectation of what's there. But all of that AP information is found on the College Board website. As far as what our teachers should be assigning, that they really, the AP might shift and some of those expectations might shift, but the honors classes and every other class should really be adhering to that. Thank you, that makes total sense. The, the other one was, um, and I'm not sure if you know the answers this yet or whether it's still under uh, discussion, was how is the fourth quarter being credit going to factor into GPAs moving forward? I'm not, is that still under discussion? Um, well, it's, it's not under discussion in terms of, um, it's not just fourth quarter that's credit. It is uh, our second semester, our spring semester grades are credit, no credit. Um, there is no GPA consideration for credit, no credit, because a GPA is based off of a point value designated with each letter grade. However, there will be no letter grades under the credit, no credit uh, semester um, grading system so it, it it won't factor into the GPA um, at all however that's where the colleges and universities are um, a, a lot of them have just come out that they're not looking at grades anyways for that semester and therefore that um, GPA even if schools are continuing to provide letter grades it won't be um, that will they will be taken out of that GPA consideration so I know that that's specifically frustrating and hard to hear for our AP honor students who um, do oftentimes, you know, really see that as an advantage to get that, that GPA bump through those classes. Um, and my response to that is um, to just say that, we're, you know, we're sorry that, that that is a frustration that you have. Um, and, um, and we're all navigating this uh, global pandemic, really trying to hold the prior priorities of the health and safety and well-being of of ourselves and in, in our community um, to the highest, you know, standard. And to be clear on that, Mr. Bell, so the column that typically has Q3 grades, since it was technically closed before the shelter in place, will be left blank, or what does that look like for transcript purposes? Yeah, um, good clarification. Transcripts have never reflected quarter grades. They've only reflected semester grades. Um, and a lot of the feedback that we are hearing, I actually think we have a board member as a parent who's on here. Um, I, won't, I won't make her speak to that, but I know a lot of um, the feedback that the board heard um, and that uh, I was hearing as well um, from our teachers is, um, no one expected this to happen. No one was, um, I mean, there might've been people speculating by the time third quarter started, but I think um, to a full on school closure for the remainder of the year, I think was really out of the realm of what, um, you know, we were anticipating or planning on certainly. And um, so a lot of the teacher feedback was how, inaccurate the quarter grade really reflected that students work. Um, many teachers only had a handful of assignments in, um, the others were in the middle of larger projects that, um, that would have been turned in fourth quarter, but a significant amount of work had been done third quarter, um, you know, for that project. Um, that, um, you know, a, a lot of feedback from students as well on trying to, trying to work with um, us as administration and teachers because they wanted to up their third quarter grade because they were like, well, I hadn't turned this in yet or this was um, these assignments, I was going to be allowed all these test retakes and I hadn't taken any of those test retakes. And so they were really trying to mitigate and manage that out of a, a fear or concern um, that it wasn't really accurately representing them and that third quarter grade wasn't, wasn't representing them. And so um, that third quarter grade, it, it won't, it, it's going to, your transcript will look 
um, the same in terms of what it has in the past, that you'll see a letter grade for semester one for all your classes, and then you'll see credit or no credit for semester two with all of your classes. Travis, the only other question, not really a question as much as kind of a theme of, of comments, is just about the, ch the challenge of the daily schedule and the overlapping of Zooms, yeah. uh, in particular where we're having teachers um, who teach a class multiple times. So maybe they're trying to teach their first period class, but they're actually doing the Zoom during third period, and that that's a challenge for kids, and then they have overlapping. So I know you spoke to that a bunch, but that was kind of the other theme of questions that were in the in the in the Q&A. Yeah, and I would just say, um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're really trying to work on one being as flexible as possible while still adhering to as much of a schedule as, as possible that we can. So it really is this balance that we're having to navigate um, as a staff and as a school. I'm sure you're doing the same at home as, as family units. Um, and, um, uh, you know, even some of our most engaged students and families are still, you know, that nine o'clock is like the really like, all right, it's time to get up and get moving while other students are setting alarms for one o'clock meetings. So, um, so I think like, the, the reason for the overlap that people might be experiencing, especially for any of those teacher office hours that are being um, happening during academy periods, the overlap of, um, I was able to offer this class a synchronous lesson, so the next day I'm gonna offer this class a synchronous lesson, but the people in this class are feeling like they, they need to go to this one yeah. as well, because they're gonna be on two different topics, and it does create that, you know, that overlap, and, um, and so we're just trying to work as best we can to try to adhere to that schedule as best as possible and continuing to share out best practices on what that looks like for um, our teachers and for our students. Yeah, I, I think your answer is exactly right. And I think in particular, we need to make sure that teachers know that, that if they're holding a synchronous class, they really cannot mandate attendance and it needs to be recorded and posted somewhere for those kids who are having these conflicts, you know? Yeah, correct. To me, that was kind of the end of the Q&A, um, uh, although I did have one comment that uh, a parent said they would also like to see the answers to all the Q&As. So I think uh, as a team, we might need to brainstorm how to, how to do that after. Um, I think I'm able to save all of these and we'll, um, uh, well, I'll see what I can do. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to copy and paste, uh, even if these just go into, um, um, into like a comment section on like the, the Facebook upload that we do, or maybe we can try to send them out um, through an APC newsletter. So um, can we, can we quickly clarify one thing though, just with third quarter grades, those are not reflected anywhere in transcripts, correct? Yeah, I think we, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify cause you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, this was our first Don's Dialogue webinar. Um, I know I had a great time. I hope you guys did too. Um, I would love to just turn it over to our parent club, clo parent club co-presidents if there's any sort of closing remarks or next steps or follow-up from you guys. Go ahead, Don, and then I'll chime in. Sure. Um, I think the texts that we're getting as we're listing have been um, tremendously positive. So I think the sense is that despite the fact that we can't come together live, that this webinar format is worth doing again. So we will plan to do that our next Don's Dialogue and we can even talk with the leadership team, admin team, as to whether or not we should even do, you know, one every two weeks instead of waiting until next month. Um, the only thing we'd like to close with quickly is if you're reading our newsletter, which we hope you are, um, there really is great content. One of the things we're putting in each week is related to the Community Can't Be Canceled campaign. It was a campaign started by AHS leadership really innovative and creative and APC along with AHS and our uh, booster counterparts and LPI, um, the chamber uh, and a number of other local um, groups are just working to keep this campaign going not only in this pandemic time but really into the fall and forever kind of how can we bring um, some community to our community uh, so as far as um, upcoming things, we will have another effort to support our Lafayette businesses. We thank you all so much for everything you did for the restaurant community. Yeah. And our next thing will be non-restaurants and maybe ways you can engage with um, local businesses for Mother's Day gifts, graduation gifts, things like that. So we hope you'll keep watching. We also have some ways you can give financially if that's an option to you during this time. And I think Sarah has another 
Wow. Yeah, we're excited. We've um, partnered with Camp Alindo, Miramonte, and Las Lomas, our district um, school partners, on a food drive for the food bank of Contra Costa um, and Solano counties. Um, as we know, this has been such a hardship for many families um, in our neighboring communities, and the need is great for both monetary donations and food, non-perishable um, food donations. So on Monday, um, we the food bank is delivering bins to all the four campuses, and you'll start seeing signage going up around the area. Um, of course, we recommend you follow all shelter in place guidelines when, if and when you decide to participate in donating um, some canned food or, or items to the bins. I think one of the best ideas is if you are already out shopping, maybe you designate a shopping bag specific for donations that you can just drop off on your way home. So really encourage you to participate in that. It's a wonderful way to give back and easy if you're already out doing your shopping. Um, and encourage your kids you know, to get involved too. And we'll have a link in our newsletter on how you can donate online to them directly, which apparently the monetary donations are actually more important because they can do more with money in their pocket than actual food, um, but either is wonderful. So you'll be seeing that shortly. And other than that, we're gonna to continue to try and keep ways of um, keeping the Don's family's family engaged um, over the next few weeks, um, culminating the end of the year. So thank you. Awesome. Hey, thank you guys again for joining us on our first ever Don's Dialogue webinar. Um, and I agree, it just really was a, a good experience and look forward to um, more in the future. So um, we'll leave you with, a, with um, a round of Go Don's and hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Friday, Friday um, and weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, um, stay indoors, stay home. Go Don. Right. Go Don. Go Don. Thanks everyone. Thank you.